Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Stephen Yakubov. I'm going to talk today about understanding the Watchman device, talk about its device characteristics, and then discuss some of the upcoming clinical trials as well as our evolution to the flex uh, device for left atrial appendage occlusion. I am the chair of the Advanced Structural Heart Disease at Riverside and Ohio Health and uh, the system chief of the Structural Heart and Interventional section here. Here are my disclosures. The Watchman left atrial appendage occlusion device is the commercially available device for us to use to close the left atrial appendage. It consists of a nit nitinol frame as well as a PET fabric cap. There are fixation anchors that allow the device to be fixated to the left atrial appendage at the pectinate muscle level. And then there is a threaded insert for delivery of the device and for release of the device. It comes in five different sizes, ranging from 21 millimeters to 33 millimeters in size. And this covers the majority of left atrial appendage widths. The Watchman device has access sheets to deliver the device. There's an anterior curve, a double curve, and a single curve. The double curve is used most of the time, and it's the curve that I use in almost all cases. Only selective cases do I use an anterior curve, and it's a rare event that I will use a single curve. This is a transeptal access system. It's a 14 French device. Um, there's a 75 millimeter working length. Typically, transeptal access is achieved by a variety of different techniques. My preferred technique is using a transeptal sheath with a radiofrequency needle. So this is done under transesophageal echo guidance or uh, intracardiac echo guidance. Once uh, the transeptal needle is in position and my typical location for a puncture of the septum for watchman would be an inferior and posterior location. Anywhere mid-mid is usually acceptable, but the more inferior and the more posterior you can become is uh, preferred. This gives a much better or direct access to the left atrial appendage. Here you can see the, the guiding sheath is at the, um, at the septum at a favorable location. The RF needle is introduced to the um, area that you want to cross. The reason I use a radio frequency needle is to stay on the site that I've selected to do the transeptal puncture. To me, this has been the most reliable way to not have movement of the needle and to get the exact location that I would like of the septum for crossing. I do believe that if you choose the correct site on the septum, your chances of success are enhanced tremendously. I never use the PFO. The transeptal needle, the RF needle, allows you to have an accurate location and, and the, the, the cleanest puncture. There's no tearing, there's no movement that you often get with a Brockenbrau needle. Use of TE uh, echo guidance is really helpful. I don't ever do this with fluoroscopy alone. The TE echo guidance helps you determine if there are any problems during the case, such as a pericardial effusion that's easily detected. And after transeptal puncture, we routinely look for a pericardial effusion, even if the uh, procedure has gone along perfectly smoothly. The working views for implantation into the left atrial appendage. Um, there's an echo view that correlates with a fluoroscopic view. So if you're in the AP cranial view, this is typically the echo views at zero degree. Uh, this, the location that we often work in is an areocaudal. I typically take an angiogram in the areocaudal view. This corresponds most often to the 135 view on transesophageal echo. These are the views that I use. Um, that areocaudal to me is the best working angle from a fluoroscopic uh, standpoint. Here you can see what the areocaudal view looks like on the left. 
the areocaudal has a pigtail catheter inside the guiding sheath. And the Watchman guiding sheath or access sheath has markers on it to help you tell the length of or depth of the appendage to help you choose which device you might need. <clears throat> the pigtail catheter is what I use to do the angiogram and never do the angiogram through the access sheath. I think the pigtail catheter allows you to intubate the appendage uh, the safest and allow that to be used as a rail to introduce the access sheath. On the right side, you can see it's an X-plane of the uh, transesophageal images. The, the 135 view and the 45 degree view are an excellent X-plane image. I really like that 135 view for implantation, for identification of the interior and the posterior lobes. I prefer to be in the anterior lobe virtually every time. Again, here's another angiogram with uh, the transeptal puncture has been done. Once in a while, there are pacemaker wires. Uh, in this particular instance, there's an atrial lead, a ventricular lead, and a CS lead. And uh, it's important to not be caught in any of these wires when you do the transeptal puncture. The guiding sheath has been taken across the septum. That's typically done over a stiff wire. I often use a protract wire, um, to, uh, which is a curled wire in the left atrium. I rarely use a wire that I introduce into the uh, pulmonary veins. I think it's safer to use uh, a stiffer curled wire to introduce the uh, guiding sheath. The pigtail catheter is at the anterior portion of the left atrial appendage. That will allow me to take the access sheath up into the left atrial appendage and help measure the length or the depth of the appendage that I have for working. The measurement of the left atrial appendage width can occur in a variety of ways. It can occur on this angiogram where you can measure the width of the appendage knowing that the guiding sheath is about four and a half millimeters. Um, a second way of measuring this is by transesophageal echo. Uh, I do add four millimeters to the measurement on the, um, on the transesophageal measurement and take the next largest size beyond that. So if the transesophageal echo measured 21 millimeters is the greatest width, I would add four to that. And then um, the next biggest size would be a 27. And that's the device I would choose. I would put the access sheath up into the anterior lobe. That's my preferred direction of delivery. And um, I would make sure that I have at least 27 millimeters on the access sheath into the appendage before I would uh, deliver the device. The access sheath is delivered over that pigtail catheter uh, for, for a safety feature. So the sheath alignment um, in the anterior lobe, if you, if you use the 45 degree view, um, the anterior lobe will be on the right side of the appendage. You can see where the access sheath is um, on that 45 degree view. It is in the anterior lobe, which is on the right side of that appendage view. The uh, posterior lobe tends to be more toward the circumflex artery in the 45 degree view. So here is the deployment of the left atrial appendage occluder. You can see that the uh, occluder is flush occluded with the circumflex vessel on the 45 degree view. There's a slight shoulder sticking out in the 135 degree view, but it's still uh, well opposed and deep enough into the appendage on that view. And we use all of these views to make sure that we have complete occlusion of the left atrial appendage, the device is not sticking too far out into the um, left atrium, or that the shape of the device is incorrect. So we will use angiography as well as transesophageal echo for proper deployment. What's an acceptable result? Well, in the Watchman trials, anything less than a five millimeter uh, um, leak or jet would be a an acceptable result. Again, we try to go for zero every time. We don't recapture often trying to get to zero. If we've done what we believe is the correct deployment, usually the anterior lobe with the correct guiding sheath 
at the correct depth of deployment, and we like the shape of the device both by angiography and by transesophageal echo, that's usually acceptable. But it's, it's preferred to get the smallest jet possible and not to miss any lobes. I prefer not to have to recapture. I think that recapturing can introduce irritation of left atrial appendage. You can get some weeping of the appendage and cause pericardial effusions. So take every uh, bit of time to do the deployment correctly on the very first time. I think that's the best opportunity to get the best result. Now we're used to doing delivery of the Watchman device by transesophageal echo, but another way that we've been doing this lately is by 3D ice guidance. And so here is a transeptal puncture using ice guidance. And uh, this is the transeptal puncture on the left with a 3D view or 3D reconstruction. It allows you to know exactly where you're going in the, in the uh, foramen. Here we have a, an uh, excellent site in the inferior posterior portion of the, uh, of the foramen ovale. And it's nice to get one view and then the, that 3D ice is able to reconstruct what that whole um, image should look like. So here is uh, an example on the left of a 3D ice image of a left atrial appendage watchman deployment. And what you can see here is that the appendage is in the left atrial appendage. We usually get the view with the catheter in the left atrium. How we do this from a technique standpoint is there is transeptal puncture with introducing of, introduction of the 14 French Watchman device um, in the usual fashion. So the, left, so the Watchman access sheath gets delivered to the left atrium. The, the catheter then is pulled back into the right atrium and the trans and the uh, 3D ice catheter there is, is passed along the wire through the hole that was just created in the Peyton Freeman Valley along that wire um, as a buddy technique into the left atrium. Once that ice catheter is in the left atrium, the watchman sheath is then reintroduced across the stiff wire that's already in the left atrium. And you have both devices in the left atrium through the same puncture site that doesn't cause excessive disruption of the patent or of the, uh, of the transeptal puncture. There are two views that I use characteristically with the ice technique. One is in the mid left atrium. The other is against the mitral valve. This image is of the mid left atrial view where we're able to look right at the on fast view of the, um, of the left atrial appendage. And then the uh, image on the right is 3D reconstruction of that whole left atrial appendage and verification of placement of the Watchman device. Here is a mitral inflow pattern. So in this, um, or in this particular image, the ice catheter is flexed against the mitral valve instead of against the septum or the mid, -left, mid atrial view. And once an, an appropriate image is obtained, 3D reconstruction can be uh, done of the whole appendage to verify placement of the, of the device, a measurement of the device, all pass criteria, et cetera. More images of the um, mitral inflow view. These are very similar to a transesophageal echo image. The mitral inflow view is my favorite view. It really does allow us to see uh, what this left atrial appendage device looks like in the appendage. And I think that the images that you see with 3D ice are um, just as good as transesophageal Im imaging. The nice thing about it is you don't have to give sedation, you don't have to give general anesthesia, and the procedure is, um, can become an outpatient procedure very simply with this technique. All pass criteria can be verified using ice imaging also. So the essential points of Watchman are the pre-planning is essential, CT scanning can help you decide what your approach is gonna be and what the size of the appendage may be. The transeptal puncture should be precise. Choose the best catheter, the guiding catheter ahead of time. It allows you to do one deployment and gives you the best success. Typically, I choose the anterior lobe for deployment. 
IFT or ICE are both excellent imaging strategies. I think many of us will use ICE more commonly, 3D ICE especially. And again, to limit any complications, trying to achieve correct implantation on the first deployment is very important. I would like to talk a little bit about the Watchman Flux device. This is the next generation left atrial uh, occlusion device by Boston Scientific. This has a fully rounded flex ball. It's a single component left atrial uh, appendage closure device with full recapture and repositioning. The changes in it are there are nine uh, anchors arranged in two rows. This is designed to give the, um, a shorter device and minimally exposed metal. So that allows us potentially to heal a little bit better and to eliminate what we might uh, see as device-related thrombus or um, that is a, still a little bit of a problem with the connection device on the Watchman. That does occur in about 4% of uh, patients. The Watchman Flex gives us greater sizing uh, capacity. So we can go from, um, with a 20 millimeter device up to a 35 millimeter device, we can get very small appendages quite good and we have a wider range on the upper end of appendage widths. The Pinnacle Flex IDE study was a single arm non-randomized trial. It was in 400 patients at 29 sites. There was a um, 45 day TE as we're used to doing to verify correct healing and no uh, residual leaks. Doax and aspirin were, were used for 45 days and transitioned to aspirin and Plavix, and then eventually aspirin uh, indefinitely. And there was 12 month follow up in this study. There's a primary safety endpoint of all cause death, stroke, and systemic embolization, and a secondary endpoint of ischemic stroke at 24 months. And what we can see from this, um, this IDE study is that the Pinnacle Flex does show an improvement of complete sealing. So there are less uh, jet sizes of greater than five millimeters. Uh, the TE was adequate in virtually every case for identification of true closure and complete sealing was enhanced with this device. The complete sealing was over 90% at 12 months. So if we put the anticoagulation discontinuation in perspective, anticoagulation discontinuation in 45 days um, has improved over time with Protect AF, it was 87%. By the time CAP2 came along, it was up to 93%. And with Pinnacle Flex, almost all patients can be discontinued from their anticoagulation at 45 days. Device-related thrombus is less. Um, I think that, uh, the occurrence of device-related thrombus is very rare with the Pinnacle Flex in this IDE trial. We'll learn more as it's used in, in um, many more patients. But the timing of pericardial effusions and ischemic strokes were very rare, and only a few occurred late. That leads us to current trials that are upcoming with Watchman Flex. Uh, one is the option trial. And this is to test the hypothesis that is left atrial appendage uh, closure a reasonable alternative to NOAX falling afib ablation? Remember, most of the Watchman trials were done against uh, Coumadin, and this will be testing Watchman falling AF ablation alone. And this will be randomizing the Watchman flex versus oral anticoagulation with patients uh, followed for three years. And then the Champion AF trial, which is an FDA randomized clinical trial. This will be one-to-one -one randomization of Watchman Flex versus NOAX for patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. These patients will be CHADS-VAS 2 or greater, 2,000 patients enrolled at 150 centers. And um, we will get great information about the utilization of Flex versus NOAX in this clinical trial. Thank you for your time and attention.